Last year, we covered the sole television series helmed by the late great Satoshi Kon. Today, we're returning to Kon's short list of masterworks, beginning with his directorial debut on a feature film, 1997's Perfect Blue. This one is a big one, however, and we won't be able to do it alone. That's why we've called in some help from friend of the show and Kontaku, Professor Dead Palette. My name is Dead Palette, and I think anime is dumb. I've watched thousands and thousands of them. I have an expert opinion. Anime. Not even once, kids. Thanks for joining us, DP. Perfect Blue is perhaps one of the most important anime films of the 1990s. Whether we're discussing the cult status of anime abroad, the acceptance of anime as a serious art form, or the influence that the film exerted on Kon's career, as well as the course of theatrical anime films as a whole, it would be difficult to understate what this film was able to accomplish. In the late 1980s and early 1990s, Satoshi Kon consistently found work as a manga author, an artist as well as an animator, a writer for film, and a one-off director for JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. The trajectory of Kon's career changed in the mid-1990s when screenwriter Sadayuki Murai was selected to adapt the 1991 novel Perfect Blue for film. Rumor has it, the film was originally intended to be a live-action film, but was later changed to an animated project. The story goes that this occurred due to film studio damage caused by the 1995 Kobe earthquake. Considering his varied background working in animation, Satoshi Kon became attached to the new animated version of Perfect Blue as a director. Only four years later, he began a four-project streak composed of Millennium Actress, Tokyo Godfathers, Paranoia Agent, and Paprika. These films and television projects were no doubt allowed thanks to the success both at home and abroad of Perfect Blue, given its appearance at several international film festivals, as opposed to most of its contemporary anime films not seeing as wide of a release, as well as its release in foreign territories, a practice saved at the time for only the most commercially viable or popular anime films. In turn, the film provided influence for other directors even outside of animation. Perhaps most notably, two films by Darren Aronofsky, Requiem for a Dream and Black Swan were heavily influenced by today's subject. The American director purchased the remake rights to Perfect Blue, and used one particular moment from the animation to create a disturbing scene in his own major breakthrough. A decade later, he created what many fans of Perfect Blue have claimed to be a ripoff of Cohn's original film, a tale of a ballet dancer losing her grip on reality, and finding herself drawn into her own mind and her own madness. Accolades aside, let's stalk the film through a dark alleyway at midnight in the pitch black, and then write a blog post online to see why Perfect Blue was so important when it was released, and why the film has remained as simultaneously well-regarded and notorious as it has to this day. Arguably, the primary theme of Perfect Blue is the lack of privacy in an increasingly digital age. While the internet's precursors had been around since the 1960s, the popular inception of this revolutionary technology was not seen until the mid-1990s. Directly following this, several notable anime began to question quite heavily what this new, unprecedented interconnectivity would mean for humanity and civilization. Present day. <laughs> Present time! <laughs> Perfect Blue, one of the first of these anime projects, was in this way ahead of its time, accurately predicting what the internet at large, and more specifically social media 10 or 20 years later, would entail. While the social media present in the film is primitive by today's standards, we can see how the Mimania blogger is an early analog to the modern phenomenon of stolen identities and digital cults of personality. Today, anyone on Twitter without a blue checkmark Lull. runs the risk of having their identity jacked by literally any user willing to put in the time and minimal effort to step into someone else's digital skin. Mimania similarly operates the same way. They simply post online as Mima with enough evidence to convince some people they're actually Mima. This further dilutes one's personal sense of identity, forcing the individual to question who the real them is. In turn, this means that the internet and modern technology have started to break down the borders between social elites and celebrities and the unwashed masses. Everyone loves drama, but drama is a very vague term. The kind of drama that you're ingesting matters. Conflict speaks to the nature of living, and we want to see what conflicts other people are experiencing. So we tell each other stories. Let's get into the mind of a serial killer. 
what's going through the mind of that Yakuza criminal. We can even ponder what would happen if we were placed in a life or death moral conundrum. And yes, we might even look into the lives of real people that spoke on political issues, real people that have touching stories, and actual heroes that fought the system and lost. Here's to you, Nicola and Bart. But there is a bridge that some feel it's wrong to cross. But we all love to cross it. For some, it's not even a guilty pleasure. It's just a pleasure. I'm talking about real, living, active drama, prying into the lives of others. And we do this for endless reasons. But do we have the right to investigate these public figures? Or should we just accept that the paparazzi and drama mongers of the world are a part of our culture, whether we like it or not? Perfect Blue is asking these questions. It's often said that those with nothing to hide have nothing to fear. That privacy is only for those doing something wrong. Japanese idols have reason to fear their privacy is being violated. They've dealt with an intensity of stalkers and paparazzi that most people can't begin to comprehend. On July 25th, 2001, the Japanese idol group Morning Masune released their single, The Peace. The music video of which featured young women dressed in old-timey sailor uniforms while dancing in a stylized battleship's bathroom full of urinals. Viewers were initially perplexed as to why a squeaky clean idol group would be dancing in bathroom stalls. The reality of the situation was that the video and song were in response to an incident that happened in their production offices. Someone placed hidden cameras into the squat-style toilets and filmed the members peeing. The film was then sold on DVDs. While Morning Masune had a light-hearted, tongue-in-cheek response to this violation of privacy, it was the exception, not the rule, as idol culture can be incredibly cruel and punishing. Many may remember Minami Minagishi, the pop idol and member of Japanese idol megagroup AKB48, who shaved her head publicly while crying profusely. This was to atone for her sins. What laws did she transgress? Dating. Minami did what any healthy 20-year-old girl would do. She dated a guy, and she got caught doing it. Part of the allure of Japanese idols is that they're available. So to keep this illusion going, production companies for idol groups make sure that idols don't date. Japanese idol culture is more puritanical and restrictive than religions in most Western countries. Early in Mima's story, it might be easy to think that the pressures on her are overstated or think that the later conflicts she faces are just too silly and fantastical. But with a little more cultural context, you can see that Mima's story hits very close to home for Japanese idols. Idol culture has always had a dark underbelly. But Perfect Blue predicted how much more strange, oppressive, and delusional it would get, releasing over 15 years before Minami would shave her head in a bizarre attempt to regain her purity in the eyes of the public, while suffering obvious emotional abuse at the hands of her production company. Through the character of Mima and the lens that Mimania places upon her, Perfect Blue also examines this false dichotomy we perceive between innocence and filth. In turn, this is true of idols in the real world, the manufactured young stars who populate various boy bands and female pop groups. Naturally, for Satoshi Kon, the idol was an easy pick to explore the breakdown of one's individuality as well as this separation of filth and innocence, given the massive idol culture present within Japan, where the pop fandom never really died off as it did in America. This is to say nothing, of course, of the second coming with One Direction. Praise be unto them. <laughs> Celebrities are objects. Look how the stalker Mimania holds Mima in his hand, like she's an anime figurine on a shelf, there to be observed and appreciated aesthetically. See, I bought into Mima and Sham as a whole. I attend Sham concerts, handshake sessions, and live events. I own a Sham poster and t-shirt. I'm an important part of the Sham community, and I run a Sham fan magazine. When you really think about it, I'm entitled to criticize Mima for her poor choices. But Mima 
is a person. Mima is a passive person, one that avoids conflict. This passive attitude is valued in women, especially in Japan. This has led to Mima becoming a welcoming mat to everyone around her. Everyone knows what's best for Mima. The pop idol fans, Mima Mania, the stalker running the website Mima's Room, the director of Double Bind to Kao Shibuya, Mima's own parents who are upset that she's not singing anymore. Both of Mima's managers fight over what she should be doing. The only person considerate of Mima's feelings is the actor playing her attacker. Talk about irony. Although the manager Totokoro does have sympathetic moments towards Mima as well. Mima is responsible for every action that she takes. No one is forcing her to do anything if you take the events of the film literally. However, she is subject to an endless barrage of loud, obnoxious, opinionated voices. Each voice telling her to do something different than the other voices. No wonder she's unsure whether or not she's the real Mima. In the same way, we can look at how in America, a number of different celebrities have undergone a lewd or provocative transformation. It can either ruin their careers or, if manipulated properly, it can be used to enhance them. Think of Miley Cyrus at the VMAs in 2013 and how disgusted the outrage media was by her performance alongside Robin Thicke. Only a few years later, consider Shia LaBeouf reinventing himself post-Transformers. And holes. Really, you can look to any of the squeaky clean former Disney child stars and the various dark paths their careers and lives seem to travel following their tenure with the mouse. Whether we're discussing the Even Stevens star taking part in a five-hour Lars von Trier film about unbridled female sexuality and partaking in bizarre performance art pieces for several years, or we're looking at the controlled 21st century punk rock drug-fueled Wayne Coyne influenced tumble from fame into notoriety of the former Hannah Montana body double. There's always the question of how much these stars' marketing companies are manufacturing these scenarios to garner press. Regardless of the genesis, however, the impact of these events is very real. Outrage for the sake of fame. Perfect Blue explores this from an earlier perspective, asking whether Mima's transformation from pop idol to drama star is her own decision or if it's at the behest of her managers and her fans. An example of this is Mima's constantly needing to tell herself that this is what she wants and that she wants to redefine herself. That Cham was throttling her potential and that their newfound success without her is definitely not something she left behind to move on to an acting career. Idols and celebrities are in one sense a sacred cow, with their many fans and stands not wanting their holy images to be torn down. Look at the backlash just this month to the HBO documentary Leaving Neverland, how vitriolic both sides of the argument concerning Michael Jackson's guilt or innocence have become. Alternatively, however, many of their detractors and even everyday folk seem to almost want this perception to be broken. In fact, we revel in the innocence becoming corrupted, as seen in tabloid headlines or on the TMZ news ticker. Anytime a major celebrity or politician is on trial, we flock to our TVs and news feeds to witness their potential downfalls. In a way, this helps us feel superior to people more well-off than us, helping it seem like we're more in control of the world than them. In much the same way, Mima's stalker, her manager, and the many civilians we encounter throughout the film seem to oscillate between these two ends of the spectrum, both loving and hating her fall from grace. Ultimately, however, Perfect Blue shows us that celebrities are just normal people like us. Their jobs just allow them more name recognition. We see Mima go to the grocery store and purchase food. We see her riding public transport. We see her returning to a small one-bedroom apartment. She's one of us. She just happens to be famous. The internet and social media has changed the way that news, information, and reality is filtered to us. Our brains have been rewired because of it. We seem very susceptible to outrage, gullible for fake news, and prone to filtering out horizon-widening information. A false flag is a covert operation designed to deceive the public into believing a particular group or nation is responsible for a bad action. And this type of deception is rampant on the internet where anonymity and gullibility intersect. When Takao Shibuya winds up eyeless and dead, robbed of his male gaze as it were, the public is left to ponder who done it. Mima publicly stated she was fine with the role director Shibuya gave her. Was that a lie? The Mima's Room website says it was. So did Mima kill director Shibuya? Did a crazed fan? Are all Mima's fans violent and crazy? 
Or did someone that hates Mima and her fans kill director Shibuya to make the Mima camp look bad? Bolder false flag attempts happen every day in the internet age, and the quarry of the false flag is left with no way to prove their innocence. We take our trust for granted and don't consider how people with celebrity are a stone's throw away from having their reputations ruined. Who gets stressed and has to deal with the public pressure and aftermath of Takao Shibuya's murder? Mima. Millions of people ponder whether Mima, or at least one of her fans, is a murderer. Outrage. It's so fun, and people get so swept up in it. This lady sue her nephew over a hug. These babysitters practice satanic rituals with children. Suing over spilled coffee? All of these and many, many more were proven to be obviously false after the media frenzy died down. But in the internet age where everything is searchable, one witch hunt can ruin a life. Have you been a part of any witch hunts lately? Perfect Blue also explores the interaction of art and reality. The film remains unclear at any given time what is reality, what is fabrication or hallucination, and what is the TV drama guest starring Mima. Like several of Satoshi Kon's later projects, Perfect Blue revels in the sheer anarchy of Mima's potentially fractured mind. Through this, it explores how her job, her personal life, and her mental state interact. The film asks us to question whether Mima is indeed losing her mind due to a lack of personal identity. Is she, in fact, struggling with the move from idol to actress? Or is the narrative of the film itself toying with this in order to provide a fakeout? More questions are raised when we do not take for granted that Mima is insane, and instead take the film as a statement on art and reality. Is the show which marks Mima's acting debut being written to coincide with real events, with the writer drawing on his experiences to increase the effects of his work? In contrast, is the entire premise of the show a hallucination to help Mima deal with the trauma she may be experiencing in her life? If this is the case, we could see the plot of Perfect Blue as her fractured mind trying to repair and protect itself. On the flip side, if Mima was not subject to trauma as an idol or earlier in life, is acting in the show, namely in the staged rape scene, causing her real trauma? Perfect Blue, through these questions, explores the messy, unique relationship between art and artist, and by extension, observer and art. We see that when someone takes part in a creation that is important and personal enough to them, they form a symbiotic relationship with their art. Mima may not be in total control of Cham, nor the television drama, nor may she be entirely happy with all of the creative decisions with either of these projects. However, she pours her heart and soul into this. Her creations, in fact, define her to the general public, meaning that whether for herself or for the sake of her image, she goes through the turmoil of working as an artist. Again, the fragmented narrative of Perfect Blue plays into this. Whether her mind is warping or not, Mima is giving to her art, and her art is in turn giving back to her. As she becomes a member of Sham, and later an actor, the events she encounters and her personal life coincide. Together they form a never-ending cycle which in turn makes it difficult to separate the art from the artist. In terms of the observer interacting with the artist's creations, the stalker and Mimania provide the strongest examples of how this relationship plays out. The stalker's worldview is as warped as Mima's own. While she suffers from an identity crisis, he by proxy experiences a similar crisis of faith. He has so intensely assimilated the works of Cham into his persona and his outlook on life that when Mima changes, so must he. Mimania, meanwhile, wishes to impose their own will on the legacy of Mima by rewriting her personal life. Here, it's less a question of art affecting Mimania, and more so an issue of working with Mima's public image affecting them. Again, the image has changed and been dirtied with the television drama, meaning that it needs to be scrubbed clean. Reasons need to be given as to why it's not Mima's fault for taking part in such shocking scenes. Mima needs to be returned to her previous pure, saintly image. Being surreal doesn't mean throwing together a bunch of strange images. It means creating a world with a reality that is consistent, but warping and melding. A world that allows for multiple valid and reasonable interpretations. The strength of this for Perfect Blue is that we're allowed to be just as confused, afraid, and uncomfortable as Mima is as she tries to navigate her world as a pop idol turned actress. To achieve all of these remarkable themes and surreal experiences, 
We must look at how important it was that the film was animated. Supposedly, the animated format was chosen for the film once the Kobe earthquake harmed the studio, given that animation is assumedly cheaper than live action. By extension, if this is assumed to be true, we can extrapolate that Perfect Blue achieved something truly unique on a relatively small budget. Anime and manga's art style is highly homogenous to many viewers. If you look at the current series and seasons of animes debuting on Japanese TV, you'll see a remarkable consistency and a desire to follow the pack. But Satoshi Kon's style of art stands out as being far more representational and realistic. Sure, all of the anime trappings are there, big eyes, unpronounced button noses, and thin necks. And Kon wasn't afraid of the female form either. But Perfect Blue, just like the rest of Khan's directorial work, renders its characters with realism and diversity of shape and form that most animes relegate to the backgrounds. Let's do an experiment. Go to myanimelist.net and check out the current season of anime being released, and it doesn't matter when you're watching this. As you scroll across the covers, what do you notice about the backgrounds? They're all lovingly shaded and rendered, they're all atmospheric and moody. A lot of them display an incredible amount of personality and charm. But now look at the characters in the foreground. They all seem like they've been pulled from a mold. Now look at Perfect Blue. There's a refreshing realness to the characters, each and every one of them. Even beautiful characters like Mima have a reality to their face that's absent in most anime. Real actors struggle to bring that level of believability to their characters that Mima shows from moment to moment. Whether she's feeling timid on stage or emotionally dead inside in the car ride after acting. It makes you wonder if an animation team should be eligible for an award for Best Actress. Millennium Actress. Perfect Blue is structured in a wildly unconventional manner, maintaining the sense of confusion in the audience. Mima's daily life is intercut with Cham performances from the past, while we occasionally journey into the realm of television drama or Mima's own mind where she perceives a doppelganger meant to represent either Mimania or her public image. This type of avant-garde presentation has been attempted before in live-action film, but the important thing to consider here is how much more accepting an animated film audience will be of this type of experimentation. This is to say nothing of the effects afforded here without the massive budget they would require in the mid-90s. The theme of challenging reality and our perception of the world is also represented here by the very medium in which Perfect Blue exists. In modern special effects blockbusters, it's necessary that CGI effects are hyper-realistic, or else our brains will rule out their authenticity. When we see an obviously fake animal or alien alongside actual human beings, the real elements of the scene harm our suspension of disbelief. By contrast, animation inherently makes us challenge reality, meaning that Perfect Blue plays into this strength. It takes a certain amount of suspension of disbelief to view something animated, given that we are not viewing or interacting with actual humans. It's the exact reason that we're so much more willing to praise the animated Star Wars series from the 2000s and 2010s while simultaneously scoffing at the prequel trilogy and its overuse of computer-generated graphics which at times appear glaringly obvious. Perfect Blue is a cerebral exploration of mental illness, celebrity, identity in the digital age, and the artistic merits of animation. More than two decades after its release, the film has passed the test of time, as it remains an influential piece of Japanese cinema and an important part of anime history. If you haven't seen the film for yourself, it's an experience you won't soon forget, though you'll likely recognize the portions borrowed by later projects. We would like to thank Professor Dead Palette for joining us on this journey into the mind of Satoshi Kon. It's been quite the head trip, and we appreciate all of his help on today's episode. If you haven't already, go check out his work in the field of short online horror stories. If you would like to hear short form fiction get critiqued, you can check out the Fear Fiction podcast at the Fear Fic YouTube channel, where myself, Abysme, uh, and Slime Beast read and critique short horror stories and mess around while we do it.